So with that now, I'd like to invite up to the, uh, the front of the room here three patients who have been treated with immunotherapy, and uh, they're going to share their experiences and wisdom with all of us. So uh, Vanessa, Donna, and John, would you please join me? Would you please all join me in welcoming them? <clears throat> Hey, I wanted to sit on here. That's okay. <laughs> we tried to bookend. We, we wanted to. <laughs> all right, so thanks all uh, for, for joining us. So why don't we go ahead and start with, uh, why don't you say if you introduce yourself and say a few words about uh, who you are and what type of cancer you were diagnosed with. Okay. Hi, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch. I did. Um, my name is Vanessa Brandon. And... 2014, um, June of 2014, I was having stomach pains, and I thought that ah, I must have had something bad. I had went to Chipotle's, and I said the sour cream must was terrible. But the pain got more severe, and then I started having all these other different symptoms. I went to the emergency room. And the doctor there at the emergency room wanted to send me down to have a CAT scan. And he came back and he said, Miss Brandon, you have a large mass on your large intestines. And it just took me for a loop because I said, you know, all kinds of thoughts came through my mind. How did this happen? You know, what did I do? Um, so anyhow, he said, well, okay, we're going to set you up with a colonoscopy. And I went in for the colonoscopy. And um, Dr. Johnny at um, Greater Baltimore Medical Center said, you have colon cancer. And we also see a spot on your stomach, but we're not quite sure far as about that. So on... August the 6th, I went in for surgery, and um, they removed uh, the cancer far as from the colon, and I was so thankful that I didn't have to get a colostomy bag on. And then I started my treatments at um, Greater Baltimore Medical Center, and, you know, the chemo just wiped out, hair loss, just all the horrible things as a cancer patient that you could go through. And mine just all over the place and just saying, you know, what, what's going on with me, you know? But um, just taking a lot of deep breaths and was taking one day at a time. That process, that was a journey, then um, went to see my oncologist and he said, um, you're stage four. There's nothing else we could take and do for you. And um, my family called the Cancer Center of America. So then my journey took me there. I was flying up to Chicago every two weeks for treatments up there. Um, the same type of treatment that I was getting at Greater Baltimore, but maybe just a little different with one, one medicine they had taken off. Um, with that, um, going through the same process, you know, getting chemo on Friday, going home on a weekend, getting it there. Um, so anyhow, and the doctor up there came and told me, Miss Brandon, it was nothing else that we can do for you. Uh, you know, you stage four. So all I know is that I just wanted to see my five beautiful grandchildren. Uh, graduate from high school and just wanted to continue on having Christmas with them and all. So Carl Hopkins, they told me to come in for the testing. They did the mouse swab. I guess three weeks later, they called me back and told me that you matched up perfect. All I know is that the heavens open up for me. It was like I seen a light, you know, and I know that it was from heaven. I started going over for my treatments. 
I had we'll Dr. Lee. We'll stop Lee. there um, before we get into that. <laughs> okay. uh, I want to hear from the others, but okay. we're going to get to, to okay. the good yeah. stuff okay. that you're about okay. to share with us. John, okay. why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm John Ryan, and, and if you think I look awkward in this chair, it's because I feel like a big kid in a, in a high chair and my feet are dangling down, <laughs> and you just had lunch and you don't care about that, right? <laughs> anyway, in uh, April of 2013, I was spitting up some blood in my sputum, and I called the emergency room at uh, Bethesda Executive Health. I'm a retired naval officer, and that's where I got my primary care. And she said, cease and desist yard work, go to an emergency room. So I did, and that quickly shoveled me into a PET scan and, uh, and a uh, pathology to see what it was. And they said, well, you have stage four adenocarcinoma, non-small cell lung cancer. And I said, whoa. And you have about six to nine months to live with treatment, without treatment, and about 12 to 18 with treatment. So that was... Uh, a two by four, I knew I had stepped in something pretty bad. It was shocking. And I was trying to figure out where my kids were in college and well, would I make Christmas or not? It was tough. Well, the, uh, the good news is the chemotherapy didn't work. Uh, the first two cycles, it showed a little improvement, but the second two showed uh, no improvement, serious side effects, serious loss of appetite, loss of weight. My hemoglobin was down to about seven, where you don't have any energy to move. And uh, the, the CAT scan after the, uh, the four cycles, four th three-week cycles, showed that it was not working. My tumor was winning. We had uh, taken a second opinion after hearing that since I had metastasized to my rib, and my, uh, my hip, that surgery was out and uh, radiation was out since it's spread around. You have to do chemo, and if that chemo doesn't work, we'll do a more powerful chemo. A second opinion at uh, Vanderbilt with William Powell, a colleague of uh, Julie Bramers at Hopkins, said, well, if your chemotherapy does not work, you should really consider immunotherapy Given where you live in Northern Virginia in 2013 before it was FDA approved, the clinical trial of choice would be Hopkins and you should see Julie Bramer. Her ears are burning. That was, uh, what do you have to do, where do you have to go, what has to happen? And uh, I was referred to uh, Hopkins and uh, had my first chemotherapy treatment on the uh, 14th of uh, October. 2013, I had my 121st treatment last week. Donna. Um, my name is Donna Lynch. Uh, I had, was diagnosed in May of 2017 with a large um, B cell non Hodgkin's lymphoma. I was treated with chemotherapy uh, through uh, September of 2017. At the end of September, at the end of October, a PET scan um, showed no cancer cells. So we thought we had beat it. Um, six months later, uh, it came back with a vengeance. Mine was concentrated in my neck. It was on my right side at first. Uh, it was on my left side uh, the second time. Um, and I was told standard of care would be um, harsher chemotherapy, which boggled my mind. I couldn't imagine harsher. Uh, harsher chemotherapy and a stem cell transplant if I was eligible. So I was referred for a stem cell transplant evaluation at the University of Maryland uh, in uh, Baltimore Medical Center. Um, great doctor, Dr. Dehia, Dr. Rapoport is head of the study. Uh, say hello to them if you know them for me. Um, and I was told then, I hadn't heard of clinical trials, uh, Dr. Tahia was uh, telling me what the standard of care would be, which I had been told, harsher chemo and evaluating me for stem cell transplant. Um, 
But he said, you know, the, a study has just been approved because this came back pretty fierce the second time. Um, a study had just been approved, I think just a month before, for uh, skipping the standard of care and go into CAR-T therapy where um, they withdrew my blood, took the T cells, shipped it to California, they modified them, shipped them back, gave them back to me uh, about three weeks later. And so I had the CAR T therapy um, under the clinical trial. And uh, two days after receiving the, my blood back, uh, I ended up in an uh, intensive care unit. And I was in there for five days. Um, I don't remember two days are gone. I don't remember any of that, really. Um, and it worked. Oh, 30 days after the CAR-T was, after the blood was given, 30 days was as soon as they could do a PET scan. And on the 30 days, the PET scan showed no cancer cells. I still go back. I still have my blood work regularly. The pets, cat scans, pet scans. Uh, I'm still followed, um, but I have been uh, cancer free for 15, 16 months now. That's wonderful. Um, so, so each of you uh, went through hell, right, with the standard of care at the time. Uh, then went on to a clinical trial, um, and you didn't know. So, um, <clears throat> Vanessa, let's let's hear from you. When when you heard, so we know you got the news that you were a match for that trial. Yes. Um, when was the immunotherapy that you received? How was it explained to you? Who explained it to you? Well, basically, um, the doctors um, and also the clinical trial nurse. <coughs> Holly came in and um, Dr. Lee came in and um, explained the process. Um, they also told me that, you know, for some of the side effects, um, just, you know, I'll be getting it every two weeks um, to come in. And, um, and that was, I mean, not just basically all, but, you know, just got me started. Um, made me feel really great about this clinical trial. I, you know, they surrounded me with a lot of love and I felt like attention. Um, they, any question that I asked them about it, you know, would I be sick or how would I feel after having the, you know, the trial, they explained everything for us to me. And um, I went in for my first um, treatment. Naturally, I was scared and nervous. I got really sick on the stomach and all, but um, they gave me a little something that kind of helped to calm my nerves. Um, at first, when I had started it, you know, I was, like I said, feeling a little sick and all, but at the time, it, it got better. I had a lot more energy. I was able to stay a little bit more focused. And, um, you know, going through that trial, I was on it for almost two years. Um, they would give me a CAT scan and my blood work um, because it, it just wasn't colon cancer. The cancer had moved to my liver, so I had both. And my tumors was shrinking. Um, I, I, I just know that this was a godsend. It was just a blessing for us for me to get into this clinical trial. You know, um, just everything that I had asked God to take and do for me, he did, you know. And so, um, I, I'm, I'm just saying, anyone that have any kind of, you know, feelings about not trying to participate into a clinical trial, you know, go try it because you never know what will happen far as with it. You know, I was stage four. They had given up on me, you know, and I was actually saying that 
I'm not going to spend any time with my grandchildren or, or with my son and my daughter, you know? And so anyhow, I had to walk out on faith to know that this was something that I needed to do, yeah. you know? And I, I, again, I'll just say anyone, you know, try it, you know, it might not work the first time, but scientists and, and you have all these different amazing doctors and researchers, you know, that is constantly, constantly moving, you know, to bring this disease to a halt. And, and I just know that it might not work the first time for us for you, but keep on at it because someone, someone is gonna get it right for us for you. They got it right for me, you know, and all I know is that it, they will get it right for us for you. So just, you know, I know that it's hard because your mind is saying, you know, this is the heart disease, I'm, I'm gonna die, I'm, I'm not gonna be here. But keep on saying to yourself, this too shall pass, I'm gonna get better, and I'm gonna work through this. You know, and if, you know, they, they had counselors for us for me, um, they had different staffs that talked to me, and even when I had my blood work done, you know, they would say, little things for us to me, you know, hang in there, Miss Brandon, it's gonna be okay. So just keep on pushing, keep on pushing, because we know that we have fantastic staffs at Hopkins that are doing great, great things beyond the call, the duty of everything, and, and it will come together. All I know is that I see my grandchildren, my two oldest ones have graduated from high school and have graduated from college, and then one of them went back to college. The other little ones are not there yet, but you know, just, just know that it's so important that once you see your family and that you want to take and, and live, you know, it can, it can happen. It, it can happen. Uh, what was what was actual? What was the drug, or, or what did you receive on that trial? I um, okay. Here we go. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the checkpoint blockers, I think. Yeah, yeah. it was. Okay, so, yeah. uh, and also, you, John, also got a checkpoint blockade, correct? Yes, I, I was uh, put on uh, Obdivo. Uh, when my uh, chemotherapy ended, I was in trouble. My hemoglobin was way down, and uh, my second opinion guy was saying, you need to have blood transfusions or you're not going to make it through the weekend. And... Uh, Bethesda was saying, no, we need to get him on blood thinners because he's got blood clots, and if the blood clot goes to his heart or his brain, it's over. So I, I left and was referred to Hopkins and came up and talked with Julie Bramer and went through an official review of the clinical trial process, the complete document, what the options were, and I said, please help me. And I had my poker face on. I was acting like I was in good shape, but I was terrible shape. I lost 55 pounds with serious pain in the shoulders and uh, uh, didn't feel too good about anything. So I started this clinical trial, had two infusions, and in about uh, the uh, end of October, I was bleeding a little bit and I had been taking blood thinner shots from my wife giving me this surprise every morning and every evening for a month and then once a month and, and the blood therapy was too bad so I called my primary care physician at Bethesda and I said I need help this clinical trial is my last shot I would like you to consider a collaboration with Hopkins such that you can make some fixes in a way that will happen timely enough where I can stay on the clinical trial Julie Bramer said yes I went offline, had uh, uh, Dr. Browning at, at uh, Bethesda had a freezing process. He went in, froze two places in my airway, couldn't get the third place. So they had radiation for five days, zapped that, and the upper part of the left lung got that, drained over two liters of pleural effusion. I got my stomach back, got an anvil off the stomach, and headed back, and, and there was a two-week delay in the clinical trial. I had infusions three and four, and then on the 18th of uh, December, 
I had a uh, CT scan nine weeks after it started with a 65% uh, shrink. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. But the, uh, the, uh, the, the point I think that saved the day was the uh, interagency uh, collaboration that took place between those two hospitals. I mean, that made it, and I've had three interventions, and that's the first one. Did you have a similar experience, uh, like uh, you, with your team, uh, take, you know, asking you or giving you words of encouragement, or what was what was the you know the whole trial experience itself like? I could tell you that um, when you step in something bad, you're in despair, and there's two questions you need to ask: what's out there that can help me, and who's out there that can help me? Well, it was clear that chemotherapy wasn't, and Hopkins. I had a clinical trial. Walter Reed didn't even have it. It wasn't FDA approved. When I went into the team at, at Johns Hopkins, and Julie, Julie Bermer's ears are burdened, it doesn't get any better. Nobody could do better. You want to have an organization where you are a team player. I've been maybe like a horse's ass. Ask questions. I asked clarifications. I participated at every level and had uh, total responsiveness to where I was. And I knew I was being treated fairly and it was a straight shot. Could not have been, could not have been nicer. And uh, if you're entering this, uh, what, what's, what's at stake? Well, if you're the patient, it's you. If, if you're the support caregiver, it's the one you love. So you jack that up. You don't worry about being too humble when just like the lady negotiated the no into a yes for her clinical trial, you push, push uh, kindly and aggressively and daily to get where you need to be and sleep good that night. Donna, what was your trial experience? Uh, it's sort of, I didn't go looking for a clinical trial. Uh, well, he told me what the standard of care would be, and when he explained that this trial had just been approved like a month before, and I w met the parameters, I think, um, I said, well, if it will help somebody. Uh, I had it in my neck, and it was fast growing, and before I finally got the uh, therapy, my neck was like this on the left side. Um, he... He explained it, and it kind of just fell into my lap. Uh, I didn't have to go searching, um, and I signed up for it. I said, if it will help somebody, he, and he's such a great guy. He said, uh, we're in it to help you. We want you to be okay. And that, that was the attitude I got through the whole trial. Uh, they really were in it to help you. Um, so, you know, after the I got the uh, my blood back, um, I just improved from then on. And the only other thing I really uh, he did was put me on an antiviral drug for. Um, um, he wants me on it for two years, uh, but I don't really have other treatments. I just go for blood work and tests now, to see that it it doesn't come back. But. Um, I will say one thing, in his office, um, and this is Dr. Dehias, and it may have been given to him by a cancer patient, I don't know, but uh, he has a little sign in the window in the office uh, that says, let your faith be bigger than your fear. And it really meant a lot to me. I have a large, come from a large family, great family over there that supported me through this whole thing. But I come from a large family and I have a large church group. And there were prayers from day one when I was diagnosed uh, for my recovery. And um, the sign in his, I always see it every time I go in, uh, it meant something to me. So yes, along with the doctors, uh, I believe I had divine help. Uh, and I'm cancer free. Um, 
I know all, all three of you had that kind of um, spiritual community support. Um, and it's obviously been very important to keeping your, keeping your spirits up, uh, having your, your right set of mind um, going through this experience in the right setting at these, at these treatment centers. So it's wonderful to see the, how the science and the healthcare and then you as, as a person with a will to live backed by all those people in your life, all come together and here you are today. So that's, it's just really wonderful to see. Um, I'd like to know, like, let's just touch briefly on, on side effects. You know, so you went through the chemo, ugh, right? What, what was the immunotherapy? Now, we already heard, Donna, how you had to go to the ICU. You had something called probably cytokine release syndrome, yes, right? And that's commonly seen uh, with uh, CAR T-cell therapy. Almost expected with right. that therapy. Um, oh. Now, they're, they're, they've gotten really good at knowing and expecting and then taking care of that. Um, but you two had some different side effects or no side effects? Or how was it well, different from I the didn't, chemo? They had given me some Benadryl. And basically, you know, after that, I, I didn't need it anymore. I didn't have any side effects. I mean, I came home. I would be a little tired and sluggish. But then the next day, I was like, whoa, this is excellent. You know, it, I, I didn't, you know, wasn't sick or anything. And I did fantastic, you know, as time went on, you know. So, yeah, I, I did well as far as with it. I didn't have, you know, any nauseated. I didn't get nauseated. I, you know, I didn't feel jittery. Um, the chemo brain was kind of, you know, getting a little better, you know, so, yeah. John, how about you? Uh, everybody is in, an individual has a unique situation. And uh, my, my experience on the clinical trial with Opdivo is I've had uh, the only real side effect was a little bit of itching like a mosquito bite. And I live with Cetaphil. I have a jar of that. I put a little bit on there and it goes away and, and it may pop up somewhere else. But I can tell you, just uh, two weeks ago when I had my, my last uh, infusion, I had an update on my clinical trial document where the lawyers are saying, we're going to make sure this is complete. There were seven uncommon uh, side effects and eight rare side effects that were added to the list. And it goes on from uh, A to Z of what it is, and then from left to right, from not so bad to exceedingly bad. I've been fortunate enough to, to bypass that. But I've been in a two-year clinical trial uh, going into the seventh year, and like the lady back there saying, well, how long do you keep doing this? And they said, well, if your memory cells take on, you can get off the trial, and then boom, your memory cells will do. But they don't really know what the memory cells are doing. So I'm on the threshold right now of being on an extension BMS is going to cancel my trial, and they're going to put a supplemental trial for, for several trials to uh, allow that to play out into the left. So Wonderful. I'll do it as long as they will. How's that about? How's that about? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think it's important um, to, to point out that all three of you were, were fortunate. Um, you know, it, uh, your ICU experience aside, which can be very scary, but you were in great hands um, in not having a side effects. But that doesn't, we can't paint a rosy, you know, we can't see the world through rosy glasses here. Some people do have side effects. Those can be very serious. If you're having any changes in how you feel, you've got to share that with your doctor. So it's, it could save your life. So I just have to, have to say that. Um, so uh, before we get to Q&A uh, from the audience, uh, I would like to go down the line. And, and if you could say, uh, give yourself one piece of advice um, at the beginning of this journey, knowing what you know now and that you think others in the room should know, what, what would you say? I would say get a lot, I mean, do a lot of research, you know, get a lot of information as much as you can about your disease and where your cancer is. And, you know, again, you know, go for a second opinion, you know, and if you have to get a third opinion, get a third opinion. But remember that you are in charge of your journey and your life. And, you know, that that's my opinion. I mean, my, you know, thing to you all, just remember, this is your health, your life. Get everything that you need so you can get better, so you can continue on being here, so. Thanks. John? 
Yeah, I agree fully with the idea of uh, having a second opinion and having the right team that you're working with. But once that's in place and you're on the treatment, I think uh, to me what has been important was working on myself to have uh, the, uh, the daily practice of looking at the day and looking at the good things that were in that day. However rough the day was, it's there. Uh, I had a great big old fairly mean looking nurse say, Sonny boy, just stop looking for things to worry about. <laughs> Shake it off, get a good night's sleep and see how tomorrow turns out. Well, not bad advice. You could get into a frenzy, get in a corner and worry about from head to toe, what's that ache and pain? And believe me, that goes with the aging process if you don't have any of this stuff. <laughs> so you got to go with it. And you got to think positive. And you look at yourself as a resource that may have been very important with a great big portfolio in medicine or science or business, and suddenly you're asked to do a downshift and get into the slow lane. Hey, the slow lane's a beautiful place. Get to like it and enjoy it. And uh, then look at yourself as a resource. I've met beautiful people like these two gorgeous ladies <laughs> for six and a half years, witnessed the most beautiful love stories of people given the support. And you need to be a source of positive encouragement to those people. Donna, any? I would say keep your family close. It's what pulled me through. Uh, stay positive. Um, and I'm uh, like John. Um, think of the good things and just take it one day at a time. You don't look so far into the future. Just know you're going to get through this day. And, um, and keep your spiritual life healthy. It helped me tremendously. Um. All right. Um, I just want to say thank you, far as to my family, um, Reverend Jeanette, and all my neighbors, because I would not know what I would have done without them. They came in and sit with me on the weekends that I was getting chemo at home. They did shifts, some would come in two hours, some would come three hours, whatever time. They supported me as far as to bringing meals as far as to my home. Um, I wasn't working anymore and sometimes it was really, really hard. And um, I went, um, my neighbor, Palestine, she took me um, to the barber to get my hair cut because my hair was coming out. And I didn't even know how to deal with that because every time I was washing it, it was just coming out in big hugs. But she gave me the biggest hug and told me that everything was going to be all right. And I just know from that point that everything was going to be all right, and it did. So I just want to thank God for my church family, my neighbors, and Reverend Jeanette, who prayed me through a lot. So, you know, I just want to say thank you all. All right, so now we're going to take questions. Uh, and, uh, you know, anyone got a question for Vanessa, John, or Donna? Raise your hand. We have one in the back. Uh, wait until the microphone comes to you so we can all hear you. Thank you. It's very encouraging to hear all of your testimonies today on the immunotherapy. I was diagnosed in April, and I was put on two chemos and the immunotherapy, and I'm doing great. But um, what I need to know now is, okay, so now you are still taking the immunotherapy or you're done with it. Um, has your life changed? Um, are you working out more? Are you still working? Uh, you know, how, how has your life changed after all of this? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, my life um, 
have changed somewhat. I was a daycare provider, so I'm not able to take and work because of the nerve damage in my hands and my feet. I'm still a little off balance. I go in every six weeks for a CAT scan and blood work um, to make sure that my tumors are still at a base. So, you know, they haven't grown. My cancer count is not up. So, you know, that's where I'm at as far as, you know, with, with that. Um, you know, you always kind of nervous and a little scared when you go in because you want to know them results right then and there, you know. Okay, how's, you know, the count, you know, what do the tumors look like? And when they come out and tell me that the cancer count is still low and the tumors are still at a standstill and they haven't grown, yeah. But um, I'm not um, at work, you know, at 65, you know. Sometimes I maybe want to do something part-time, but, you know, still with that, it's just one day at a time. Anyone else want to answer that? <clears throat> I've been in a pretty stable mode since the uh, December of 2013. Felt pretty good about it. I try to keep active, try to walk about a mile, mile and a half every day. I have a crazy son that runs 100-mile ultramarathons in the mountains. And I'm his crew chief, and we figure out how fast he's going to run up and down these silly mountains and where he's going to be for, for aid stations. And I can tell you, I went out in uh, 2014 to Leadville. as an elevation of uh, 10,200 feet, and it got up to 13. And I had a, a, key, or a hemoglobin of 11, and I was uh, not suited for the occasion. But my, uh, my, uh, my intent is, is to keep it moving and hope the big guy upstairs is on my side. And uh, I don't know when they're going to take me off this, if they ever do. But my intention is to die of old age from other than cancer. <laughs> I celebrated uh, 75 years in, uh, in, in the summer, and it was my 75th month. And my, uh, my, my undergraduate uh, uh, professor for my daughter says, what does the what does the pirate say on his 80th birthday? And, and the answer is, I, matey. <laughs> and uh, that's what I'm going to do in 40 days on the 26th of December Boxing Day, the day after Christmas. I'm going to say, I, matey. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be my 80th month since I started this journey, 80th month. Wow. So it's all good. <laughs> Don, any changes? It's to you. I don't go back to, but for blood work and tests. However, when PET scans are done, because I know it came back the second time, and uh, they don't really use the word cure, they use remission, uh, that there's always a possibility. Uh, but uh, so I'm happy to hear the results. Um, as far as changing my life, it makes you more appreciative of what you have especially family um, and I um, don't really have any long term that I know of uh, cognitively maybe my husband would disagree I don't know um, but I feel great uh, not any long term uh, side effects just uh, on that medication for another six months maybe um, but I've been extremely blessed we have another question Right here. I, I have a statement uh, very quickly. Vanessa is my baby girl. And um, we were in a cancer meeting uh, with some new people that had come into the cancer meeting. And one of the young ladies said, um, she looked around and she said, well, how many of you have cancer? And everybody's hands went up, except Vanessa. And um, the following month when we had the cancer meeting. The girl come in very rough, and I had not even seen her, but the spirit told me she was behind and she was coming in for trouble. But my baby girl witnessed to her, and she didn't know she had cancer at that meeting. And I get filled up every time I think about it. And when she witnessed to the sister, praying with the sister, 
And when she said she had cancer, I felt guilty. I, I went through a thing, Vanessa tell you, I, I really had to go deep because I felt responsible for her getting up, speaking about cancer, and she didn't even have it. And the next meeting, she comes in to tell us she has cancer. And I was sick. I was very sick. And it was nothing for me to do anyway after I had gone through vocal cord cancer. I'm not even supposed to be talking. And when the Lord had given me the charge to work with women with cancer, and is, this is really strange, and I'm finished. Vanessa, because I'm a person that's on the go. You can't keep up with me. And we were at a buffet, and she was getting her meal. And she spoke, and I said, of course, I speak to everybody. And she said, I live down the street from you. I said, you live down the street from me? She said, yes, I know your son. And I said, how you know my son? She said, because he's on the security ministry at church. Well, we were at a big church. And from that point on, things just melt. And I just want to say to you that you never know when something's going to happen to you. And the last thing I want to say is that cancer stinks. And it does not discriminate. It does not discriminate. It does not care if you black, white, yellow, green, or purple. And purple is our color for our cancer ministry. But when you see and know somebody that's going through cancer, have a heart. Have a heart. And I never take this off. My bracelet says, trust God. And I know everybody's in here in a different place with God. But you can't find a better place with all the drugs we take as cancer people. You can't get any higher than God. Trust him. And that's my baby girl up there who walk with me and we walk with each other to beat this thing called cancer because she is a poster child and she's cured in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, we have a question here. I guess it's really not a question, but a statement and an answer to your question. I sat here today as one of the few patients that have finished the course of Devarumab in FINSI. I was diagnosed with stage three small, non-small cell lung cancer in February 23rd of 2018. One week prior to that, the FDA approved in FINSI as an immunotherapy. When I completed my chemo and radiation, I immediately went on that for 26 treatments. No side effects wow. at all. Maybe a little tired, but at 58, who can, you can always take a nap. <laughs> the important thing, though, is this past August, I completed that treatment. And in September, went for my first CT scan. I was on a new team at that point. I was on Team Ned. No evidence of disease. I'm not doing everything that I did before I got cancer when I was a competitive power lifter, but I am back in the gym. I am doing cardio. I have been working the entire time. You can do it. And don't let it hold you back. There's faith, hope, get into it, live it daily, wake up every morning, have, have a task to do, and get out and do it. Immunotherapy helps save my life, rid me of the disease, and now it's my job to advocate and share. So when you're asking the question, of what after it, this is what we do. We live. Mm -hmm. We live. Keep, it Keep going. Amen. Keep it Amen. We, we have a question in the back. Yep. Hi, um, John, this question is for you. Um, so for your opinion, 
when, when my next pet, PET scan comes up in March, should I still continue to stay on immunotherapy, Opdivo? I've been trying to get that same answer to me for uh, into my seventh year now. And I was told, that, and they wrote an article about two years ago, in 2015, that said that when my uh, two-year clinical trial was over, my memory cells, my T memory cells would take over and my immune system would do what it was supposed to do in the first place. Well, they changed their mind because an article in 2018 says, we really don't know what the memory cells are going to do, the T cells are going to do. So given the choice now of continuing on to a supplemental one or not, if I came off and uh, that was an opportunity to give my, my cancer a, 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 a signal for revenge and go into disease progression, that wouldn't be a good story. One of the, one of the uh, doctors up in Yale years ago says, if you've got a treatment that works, don't mess with it. So right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay with it as long as I can. Okay. And I That's would recommend I the same to you too, until they say we can take you off that safely. Okay. okay. Thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you. All inspired me. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, uh, okay, one more. Yeah, one, this will be the last question. This question is for John. John, when you were on Updevo, were you on any other like natural medicine like I drink papaya leaf, I watch YouTube, and there's the papaya leaf health, and then I was on, what's the medicine? The Japanese one. Oh, uh, Fukudon. Fukudon. Have you ever heard of that? No, the only, the only, uh I've been on this drug. I'm addicted to this drug, uh, Obdivo. It's the, only thing, the only prescription drug I take is 10 milligrams of uh, Lipitor, a statin, for uh, controlling cholesterol, period. And the only reason I got on that is I have a good friend, Navy doctor, that said, statin is good for you. Why don't you try this? It'll help you out. So I did. And I've been walking it down ever since, trying to get off of it completely. No, no other drugs. I drink a lot of water, and I take a lot of naps. Fatigue naps are properly priced at my age. At our, at our last summit, actually, a question similar to this came up, and one of the doctors said, you know, there's, whatever helps you get through is great, and if it doesn't, you know, uh, contradict what they're giving you as course of treatment. But the number one recommendation was sleep. Get enough sleep. That is, we don't get enough sleep, and so that's the best thing you could do for yourself. I'm getting impossible. That's okay. All right, so let's give uh, everyone a round of applause right now. <laughs> Vanessa, John, and Donna, thank you so much. Okay.